But what Bentham is second most famous for, and I'll get back to that first thing in a little bit, was what's known as the philosophic calculus, which is to say felicity and not the doll, um, but happiness. So Bentham's calculus, and yes, this is actually the mathematical representation as far as I can tell. I was a theater major. <laughs> so someone can tell me no, but Google image search found this for all of it. Um, so Bentham's calculus assumed that the goodness or badness of an act depended on its consequences here on earth. A virtuous action produced the most pleasure in the largest number of people while producing the least pain. Ha ha tail, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be the joke all night. <laughs> so it's good to be back. It, like, you know, it's the first time since Justice that I've been on stage, so, you know, did you miss me? <laughs> so, Jeremy Bentham. Who here has heard of Jeremy Bentham? Jeremy Bentham isn't very well known, and yes, I'm gonna try and do this with these things on my head, I can't get them out of my hair. <laughs> He's not really a household name, and it's pretty obvious why. Um, he wrote constantly throughout his life, uh, sometimes as much, oh, hello. Ah! There he is. Okay, he wrote constantly throughout, throughout his life, sometimes as much as eight to 12 hours a day, for days on end. Um, and he was reluctant to publish and never did so without the prodding and promotion of friends and fans who kind of boosted his ideas into the public eye. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wished he had this book. Um, so if you haven't spent a lot of time studying philosophy of law, or like me, you avoid people who talk about philosophy at cocktail parties, um, you may not have encountered him, or you might have, and you just don't know it. So while this talk isn't quite as interesting as barnstormers or people who vomit ectoplasm, <laughs> stick with me, because I promise this is relevant and pretty interesting. So Jeremy Bentham, born 1748. So yes, this is another white dude in funny clothes wearing a wig. Doubly so with the wig, because he actually was the third generation in a family of lawyers. Yee. He was educated at Oxford and apparently hated it and lived nearly all of his life in London. So boring, right? <laughs> so after he was called to, uh, after he completed his master's, he was called to the bar and actually like declined to practice the law. He got one case in and was like, nope, I'm done. So instead, he preferred to work in the background writing to influential people to put forth his views and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing, and writing um, in tracts and essays, which he then gave to his friends to spread around into, uh, and make into policy and, and bring up in, in debate uh, in the real world. And so what he eventually became really famous for uh, was a philosophy that united empiricism and rationality, which are two factions that are not always on the same page. Um, and he used it to form the principles of something called utilitarianism. He was one of several founding fathers. I'm just gonna generalize here. Um, and so for those of you who are making the what face at me, uh, empiricism privileges our sensory experiences as the one true way to know the world. Um, which is also to say that it uh, discards the occult, the spiritual, and the, the divine. Like, you know, fairly big stuff back then. Um, <laughs> reality! <laughs> the reality-based community is here. <laughs> um, uh, the other side of the same coin, you have rationalism, which privileges thought, cognition, logic, and deduction. So this was kind of neat for everyone, having both of these in one sort of syncretic thing. Um, so if you think about it, it's kind of take what you experience as real and think about it. And Bentham did. And he kind of went, what? There's a lot of really fucked up shit in this. Like, why, by all empirical measures, oh, sorry. So I picked this girl because it, it just matched so well. <laughs> It, it is exactly the same face. This is him older, <laughs> for those of you who didn't recognize him. Um, so by all empirical measures available to him, all people were equal, and many things in society and law 
uh, relied on conventions that really didn't make any damn sense once you thought about him for a while. So he became a really ardent reformer, and he writes that he was a reformer from the age of 11. Um, and he was writing in support of women's rights and full equality of the sexes, uh, for abolition, for universal suffrage, which is to say voting not just by men, but not just by men who own property, too. Um, and he was also a critic of laws against homosexuality in Britain. So, woke. <laughs> and as part of his campaign to bring logic and clarity to the world, he kind of started with what he knew, which was the law. Uh, he was a real critic of legal fictions, which is basically lies of convenience for the court. Um, it's pretty abstract, so I'll give you a, a, just a basic idea. On adoption, a child is issued with a new birth certificate that lists the new adoptive parents as their birth parents, totally obscuring the history of where they were actually born. Um, and Bentham was very much against this when it was done just for convenience sake because it uh, sort of wiped away the history of the thing in a way that just didn't really sit with uh, rationalism. Um, so he generally advocated for uh, truth rather than the muddying of it for uh, convenience's sake. Um, the other thing he was also really bothered by was the tradition of common law. That is to say, it bothered him that courts found not that something was right or wrong or against the law or not against the law, but they said, this case is like this other case that happened in the past, and so we're going to find the same way. Um, and so he worked really uh, a lot to have these systems and precedents converted from like references to other cases into actual laws. So instead of saying, like, you, you can totally... There's a funny story about ducks, I'll tell you later. <laughs> he wanted to get things written down so that they were uh, clear. So instead of saying, this is a violation of the law because previous case said so, he'd be like, this is a violation of the law that I wrote down. Um, and unsurprisingly, the British court system didn't care. Not interested. These guys don't look like they're interested in much except what they're having for lunch, you know? Um, he was largely unsuccessful in his campaign, except one of his disciples published his writings about the law in French and inspired leaders of the French Revolution so much that he was made an honorary citizen of the French Republic in 1792. The other interesting thing here was he had been indirectly commissioned to write a rebuttal uh, propaganda style to the Declaration, the Articles of the De Declaration of Independence, um, you know, back around 1776. Um, but at the close of the war, um, he actually wrote the Founding Fathers and offered to write them a full set of legal statutes based on common law, and they declined. And so then when he found out that there was a federal system of states, he then wrote to every state and made the same offer and was declined. His hope was that after the failure of existing systems, new and more efficient systems could take their place, which should maybe sound a little familiar to some people right now. But what Bentham is second most famous for, and I'll get back to that first thing in a little bit, was what's known as the philosophic calculus which is to say felicity and not the doll, um, but happiness. So Bentham's calculus, and yes, this is actually the mathematical representation as far as I can tell. I was a theater major. <laughs> so someone can tell me no, but Google image search found this for all of it. Um, so Bentham's calculus assumed that the goodness or badness of an act depended on its consequences here on earth. A virtuous action produced the most pleasure in the largest number of people while producing the least pain. So rewarded the fundal, fundamental axiom of utilitarian, utilitarianism is it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. And this is an algorithm, a literal algorithm. It took values in seven vectors, which he called circumstances, um, and it used all of this to calculate either a positive or a negative value. Uh, to begin, you listed all the people who would be affected by this, or if you couldn't, you'd just list the number of them and use it as a multiple, uh, multiple? multiplier. Um, and then you would list out the consequences, action, the action's consequences on all of these vectors for each person and then sum them. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a, a theoretical algorithm, I think, more than a, a realistic one. 
Um, so to give you like a, an example, your decision to sleep in rather than go and work on your group project in college might have a high value of pleasure for you in the short term, but the pain of your uh, group all failing the class more than outweighs that. So why do we care? Because this is the future and everything we do is governed by algorithms and this could be a useful one. Um, especially with the development of self-driving cars and AI, um, you know, this becomes a very interesting and useful thing. So consider the trolley problem. Um, so there's a runaway trolley, it's barreling down the tracks, five people are tied to the track ahead and the trolley will kill them. You're standing next to a lever, um, which can switch the track to another, another track that will only kill one person. What do you do? You could do nothing and the trolley kills five people on the main track, or you could pull the lever, diverting the trolley uh, to the side track and only killing one person. So what do you do, assuming that you're not snidely whiplash? <laughs> you know, because that, that would be a different algorithm. Um, so would you save the five people at the ex expense of one? What if the five people were on the last day of their lives, if they had terminal cancer? Um, what if the five people were normal, healthy people, but the one was a researcher who was about to crack the cure for cancer? You know, the interesting thing here for me is that Bentham's algorithm has a pretty clear answer for each of these scenarios. Okay, so that's cool, right? Like another rich white dude with eccentric ideals and yeah, an algorithm, yeah, whatever, Laura. So I actually thought <laughs> a lot about bringing this up because we've already had so many talks about rich white guys, but there is increasing evidence um, that Jeremy Bentham was actually neuroatypical and on the autism spectrum. Um, and I'll also mention that he was 48 when the first cowpox vaccine was administered, so yeah. Um, he actually came from an educated family, so in a high intelligence profession, we know that that's now highly correlated with uh, children with autism. Um, I also mentioned he graduated from Oxford. I didn't mention that he graduated from Oxford with his master's when he was 16. Yeah, um, apparently he'd started to teach himself Latin at age three. So we also know from contemporary accounts and his own writings that he was super awkward. Like really, really awkward. He never married and everyone was like, well, yeah, because it's him, right? Um, and so it actually kind of maybe explains why he declined to be a lawyer because that would have involved going out in public and you know, doing a lot of public speaking and, and public appearances. So instead, he preferred expressing himself in writing, but he could never put forth his own works for publication, relied on friends and admirers, you know, like maybe he's shy, right? But he was so influential, even without publishing his own work, that it becomes hard to trace his, his influence in British government. Um, one of his young friends, John Stuart Mill, went on to write one of the foundational works of the feminist movement, The Subge uh, Subjection of Woman, uh, published in 1869, and uh, Bentham's friend, Lord Henry uh, Brogham, was involved in creating and promoting the Reform Act of 1832, which corrected a severely gerrymandered system of parliamentary districts, and I think we could use a little of that right now. Yeah. So, um, I also said that the philosophic calculus was the thing Bentham is only second most famous for, and no, it is not his killer Ben Franklin cosplay. I have found this image mislabeled as Franklin in a couple of places, and it's, you know, good. Um, so let's start with a little background here. Um, the early 19th century was a time of increasingly scientific uh, research in medicine, and this needed dead people. Ca ca cadavers! Science, yeah. Um, and cadavers are scarce, so you have this whole cottage industry that springs up around grave robbing, and you have things like the Burke and Hare murders, which start to happen. <laughs> I think we've had a talk on that. Um, at the time, uh, the Murder Act actually allowed doctors to dissect the corpses of criminals as a sort of additional post-mortem punishment. Yeah, but the Anatomy Act was already in Parliament proposing ways to legitimize the donation of bodies and stop the illegal grave robbing and corpse trade when Jeremy Bentham died. Uh, it passed in July of 1832 with the help of one of his friends, Thomas Southwood Smith, who comes up later. Um, and here I will mention 
Bentham was an atheist, he was a rationalist, and for him and many of his friends, the pleasures of scientific inquiry outweighed many of their other considerations about how the body was used, which was to say, per his will, Bentham's friends gathered three days after his death to eulogize him and then dissect and preserve his corpse. His skeleton was science. <laughs> Mummification. <laughs> uh, his skeleton was actually preserved and used to create a lifelike-ish dummy, which he called an auto-icon. This is all in his will, guys. Taxidermy, yeah, basically. Human taxidermy. Um, so they then dressed it in his Sunday best and seated him in a purpose-built mahogany cabinet. His head was separately mummified by Thomas Southwood Smith, using an experimental process that he'd heard from a friend who'd been doing research in New Zealand. Uh, it didn't turn out very well, so the head you see there is a waxwork. And brace yourselves, well, you already saw it, but this, this is Jeremy Bentham's real head. This is the actual head of this man. So, the, they're glass eyes, glass eyes. No, the real eyes, no. So what, what, what did they do with the cabinet? It actually was placed in the hallway of the College of London, which was where he donated all of his money and all of his manuscripts. So literally tens of thousands of pages of manuscripts. And there, he's like, you got to take these and publish these, and then I'll give you the money. And they're like, OK. And he's like, oh, yeah. And also, I get to live there. <laughs> I mean, well, not really live, but you, you know. Um, so it's actually still there. So the real head was actually exhibited at the feet of it for a while, uh, but it, 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 it was in bad shape, um, and so now it's actually kept in a climate-controlled archive storage. Um, the deprived of the real head undergrads then went on to steal the wax head over and over again and take it out to pubs. So <laughs> the cabinet is now now remains locked, but you can go visit it. Um, the college is now called University College of London. If you do go, be sure to visit the Welcome Collection across the street, because it's amazing. Um, and then decency laws against the public exhibition of human remains, you know, they only kind of open it for special occasions or guided tours. However, Jeremy Bentham was on the UCL board, and is still on the UCL board, and so they actually occasionally bring him out for voting sessions of the governing body. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, do, he looks... He, that, that was what that face said to me when I made this caption. So um, he typically votes yes and is only used as a tiebreaker, but they bring him out anyway. And I'm like, man, I guess he doesn't have anything better to do. And then as a side note, UCL is also still transcribing all of those 10,000 or so pages of Bentham's manuscripts um, online. So if you're interested in helping out, this is, man, they could use some help. Okay, so in closing, I would like to raise a glass to Jeremy Bentham. Bentham. Let him stand as an inspiration to the awkward, the passionate, the thinkers, and the neuroatypical alike, as a testament to what good you can accomplish in the world for the greatest happiness of the greatest number. To Jeremy Bentham. <laughs>